As you may have guessed, I'm writing a story here, just kind of retelling the story of Priscilla. Uh, Whose idea to drag this up? This is the incredible power of extreme wealth, the alleged crimes and legal disasters from some of the most prominent families in America, because billionaires don't play by the same rules as the rest of us. This is Dark Capital. Claire Bronfman was born into one of the most prominent families in modern history. She had the means to live any way she wanted, anywhere she wanted. But of all the paths she could have taken, she took the path that led to her serving time in federal prison for her leadership role in Nexium. This is how Claire and her sister Sara poured more than $100 million into one of the most notorious cults of the 21st century. Edgar Bronfman Sr. was the son of Samuel Bronfman, a Russian immigrant who built Seagram's into one of the largest distillers in the world and got rich during Prohibition. Claire and Sarah were the two youngest children of the late billionaire Edgar Bronfman Sr. Edgar Sr. and their mother, Rita Georgiana Webb, divorced for the second time in the 1990s, and the girls spent most of their time living with their mother in the English countryside. Claire was introverted and never finished high school, instead training as a competitive show jumper. Her sister Sarah describes her as being sweet, caring, a little clumsy, and incredibly sensitive. Claire and her sister Sarah grew up on a farm with their mother, but when they turned 18, a trust fund was waiting for each. Sarah says, We were not raised to be heiresses, nor did we understand we would be. We grew up in another world. We were just like everyone else, but then we weren't. Unbeknownst to us, we had millions of dollars awaiting us on our 18th birthdays. In the beginning, Nexium was offering executive coaching classes and appeared to be like other innocuous self-help groups. Edgar Sr. took a course and thought it could benefit both Claire and Sarah, who were struggling to find a purpose in their life. They too enrolled to the delight of Keith Raniere. But Edgar's enthusiasm waned and became suspicious of Raniere's intentions after realizing that Claire loaned her leader $2 million. It kind of opened up his eyes. Through this loan, he realized, like, oh my God, my daughters might be targeted uh, because of their immense wealth. In 2003, we put Keith Raniere, who's the leader of Nexium, on the cover of Forbes And the blockbuster quote from that piece is Edgar Bronfman saying, I think it's a cult. What this article looked into is the more strange and concerning behaviors of Keith and certain members of the group. The curtain was drawn back. It was like, this guy is not the smartest man in the world. This group has manipulative tendencies and even its coursework is really concerning. So this article really put Nexium's darker tendencies on the map, and um, it it really put Nexium's story in the mainstream media. The fallout for the story was really on Claire, and it indebted her to Keith for their whole relationship. It was this turning point where he finally had something over her, She, like, owed it to him to try to fix it, but, you know, obviously it could never be fixed because the damage was done. Keith made Claire believe that her father had it out for him and that he wanted to destroy Nexium and that Edgar was part of the Illuminati, you know, like, really crazy, paranoid things. While Edgar Sr. publicly and privately voiced his suspicions, Claire found a purpose and community within Nexium and refused to part ways with the group. After the Forbes article was published, Claire had spyware installed onto her father's computer to monitor him, according to witness testimony. According to Claire's lawyer, her and her father made up, and she helped take care of him at the end of his life. I think it's easy for us to look at 
these people who um, you know are in news stories being in a cult and like how could that ever happen like they must be stupid and their eyes must be closed you know cults don't advertise like hey join us it's fucking nuts over here like we do insane things and it's dangerous and scary it's just a group of like-minded people who want to get along and chat after time goes on you realize they cut you off from the world or you know tell you you know it's not the best to tell your friends what we do here and then eventually that alienation starts and um, the closest people to you in your life are, are people in this group and then it's too late or it's really hard to to separate because you know you do grow fondness for people that you spend time with so i think that to me that was the most interesting aspect that it's not hard. Rick Ross, a cult deprogrammer and founder of the Cult Education Institute, defended himself against a 14-year-long lawsuit waged by Keith Raniere and offers his perspective on the group. Nexium targeted celebrities, targeted the wealthy, and these people were conned. Keith Raniere would have imploded a long time before he did if it wasn't for the fact that Claire Bronfman was his bank. She and her sister Sarah were feeding him millions and millions and millions of dollars, including paying for all of his litigation. There was this incredible sucking sound coming out of their bank because the money was being vacuumed into Keith Raniere's coffers to pay for all of his lawyers. Another thing he did that was really interesting, psychologically speaking, um, was Seagram's is a Canadian company. And when the U.S. prohibited alcohol, Seagram's put whiskey distilleries on the border of uh, U.S. and Canada. And their whiskey was fed right into the black market. How Keith spun their fortune was like, your, your fortune is dirty, your fortune is evil, it came from crime, like all this, all this crazy stuff. He said, like, Claire, you need to clean this money and you can clean it through Nexium because we're a, a noble, ethical organization. And Claire bought into that. Claire gave more than $100 million to Nexium over 15 years. A major chunk of her money went towards suing Nexium's enemies, both real and perceived, to smithereens. Sara eventually left the group, got married, and moved away. She was never charged with any crimes, but Claire remained a devoted member. Over 15 years, it's estimated that Claire hired 50 to 60 lawyers to pursue cases against nearly a dozen Nexium critics. At least three people who defended themselves against Nexium's aggressive legal strategy eventually filed for personal bankruptcy protection. Barbara Boucher joined Nexium in 2001 and was one of its earliest executive board members. She dated Keith for many years. She also owned a successful financial planning company, becoming Claire and Sarah's financial advisor and managed a small portion of their wealth. Boucher was the first person to sound the alarm on the unethical practices within the group and eventually left the group. After her departure, Keith went after her in both civil and criminal court over the duration of the next eight years. 14 litigations, four states, eight judges. There were thousands of court filings and Barbara spent almost a million dollars defending herself. Ultimately, all charges against Barbara were dropped. It's been 20 years of my life, and it's taken a toll on my body and my nervous system, and I still have a lot of post-traumatic stress. Keith used Claire's money as a reign of terror within the organization. If it were not for Claire Brothman, he would have never been able to have done any of that and probably would have been brought down a hell of a lot sooner than he was. So Claire's very responsible. She played a key role. The tipping point was the day the New York Times published their article about DOS, a secretive group within Nexium. Federal investigators then arrested Keith Raniere on charges of racketeering, sex trafficking, conspiracy, forced labor, identity theft, sexual exploitation of a child, and possession of child pornography. A few months later, Claire Bronfman was indicted and charged with a racketeering conspiracy, including identity theft, extortion, forced labor, sex trafficking, money laundering, 
wire fraud, and obstruction of justice. Bronfman made a deal with prosecutors and only pled guilty to identity theft and immigration fraud, and was sentenced to 81 months in prison. Ranieri was convicted on all charges and will spend the rest of his life in prison. Probably one of the saddest things that came about through the trial was this email exchange between Claire and her father. Edgar writes, whether or not you want to believe me, I do not lie and I love you too very much. Someone is not telling you the truth. Why don't you try and figure out who that might be? Who has something to gain? Certainly not me. What would be my motive? And then he signs off, tons of love, even if not requited, pops. Keith saw a rift in a family dynamic and he exploited it for his own personal gain. She justified it for the greater good. And that is the crime. Because Keith can influence her all he wants. People can say she was brainwashed and unduly influenced. And I beg to differ. It's Claire who chooses to pick up that sword. And that's why she's a criminal. She knew it was wrong and she did it anyway. I really do think that there is goodness in her. I've seen it, I know it. And I believe that she, in the end, wants to do right and wants to be a humanitarian. She is a woman with wealth, powers, and means to fix the wrongs, which most people would never have that kind of ability to do so. She could turn this around and become, you know, quite the story down the road. The night of August 3, 1976, started off peacefully. Priscilla Davis and Stan Farr were coming back from a night out with their friends and pulling up to her Fort Worth mansion. But as soon as Priscilla stepped into her kitchen, she came face to face with a man dressed entirely in black and wearing a woman's wig. The man only said, hi, before shooting her in the chest. The shooter would ultimately leave two dead and one paralyzed that night, yet somehow Priscilla survived. And when it came time to identify the shooter, Priscilla had no doubt in her mind. Her estranged husband, Cullen Davis, wasn't just the prime suspect, but an heir to one of America's wealthiest families, and he was being charged with capital murder. At the time, he was reported to be America's richest murder defendant ever. Hi, Mr. Davis. It's Noah Kirsch from Forbes calling you uh -huh. back. As you may have guessed, I'm writing a story here, just kind of retelling the story of Priscilla. Uh, Who's idea to drag this up? Cullen's father's name was Kenneth Davis, but he went by Stinky, and he ran this firm called Ken Davis Industries, which was worth tens of millions of dollars, if not more. Ken Davis ended up passing the firm down to three of his sons, one of whom was Cullen. Priscilla Wilborn came from a really different background. She came from a blue collar town in Texas and she never knew her father. Cullen's affair with Priscilla started at their country club, but quickly progressed into something serious. Each got divorced from their current partners. It was Cullen's first divorce and Priscilla's second. Cullen and Priscilla tied the knot on August 29, 1968, the very day that Cullen's father died. Cullen immediately began building their 19,000 square foot dream home that he would share with Priscilla for a number of years until Priscilla decided to end the marriage in 1974. That July, on her 33rd birthday, she filed for divorce. And a day after that, 
Cullen found himself forced off of his own property. He was court-ordered not to come on or around the mansion or its 181-acre grounds until their divorce was finalized. It was a messy time. Two years passed since the filing, and there was still no resolution. By this time, Priscilla had a new boyfriend, Stan Farr, who lived with her in the very mansion from which Cullen was banned. Naturally, as soon as she was shot, Priscilla screamed really loudly, which alerted her lover, as she called him, this guy, Stan Farr, who was like six foot five. And he sprinted towards the kitchen, at which point he encountered the shooter, who shot and killed him. By coincidence, just as the shooting happened, two of Priscilla's friends pulled into the driveway, and the shooter went outside and shot one of them in the spine and paralyzed him. Police arrived at the chaotic scene of the crime. First responders rushed Priscilla and Bubba Gavril, who was also shot, to the hospital. Priscilla, despite bleeding from her gunshot wound, was able to identify the shooter. She said it was her estranged husband, Cullen Davis. When she arrived at the hospital, she found out her 12-year-old daughter, Andrea Wilborn, had also been killed. Police issued an all-points bulletin for Cullen, and he was arrested at his new girlfriend's home. Authorities found five weapons in the trunk of his car, but none of them matched the murder weapon. Cullen was first charged over Andrea's murder, and though the evidence in the case was largely circumstantial, he faced a possible death sentence. He hired one of the top trial lawyers in the country, Richard Racehorse Haynes, to defend him in court in the murder of 12-year-old Andrea. Haynes attacked Priscilla's reputation and undermined her credibility. The trial went on for three months, and Cullen was found not guilty. Decades after the trial, it came to light that a member of Cullen's defense team was paying someone in the district attorney's office $5,000 every single month to give intel on the prosecution strategy. It was a huge amount of money back then, and it's completely possible that it altered the course of that trial. Nine months later, one of Cullen's friends approached the FBI, saying that Cullen had wanted him to hire a hitman to kill 15 people, including Priscilla and the judge who was presiding over their divorce. Federal agents set up a sting operation to get him to admit to soliciting a hitman. Again, he hired Racehorse Haynes, and again, he was found not guilty. Cullen got married once again, and Priscilla moved to Dallas, where she spent five years living with Greg Brown. Um, to set him up, so who's, who's Greg Brown? Yeah, how do you say Greg Brown in one or two words? Greg Brown is one of Priscilla's closest friends from later in life, and actually wrote a book about their relationship. Does that work? Uh -huh. I mean, they were yeah, lovers yeah. too, technically. It's pretty complicated. Listen. I moved in with Priscilla. I was 25, she was 54. She had been the most glamorous woman living in the largest mansion with the richest man. We were both heavy drinkers. I was gay, but it was a fun, fun life being her lover. Priscilla kept Colin in court. You know, this case just didn't go away when Colin was acquitted of the murder of Andrian and of uh, the hit job on the judge. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you about some of the controversial things during that tumultuous period. I know there was an interview where you talked about Dee's cat. Can you tell me about that incident? That was uh, Priscilla's uh, daughter, Dee. Mm -hmm. This obeyed something I told her to do, and when I confronted her about it, she got smart alecky, and she was holding this kitten, brand new kitten, and I just grabbed it and threw it down, and 
it died. That's basically what happened. You, you sound like someone maybe who used to get angry, but over time has mellowed. Is that fair? I didn't get that angry very often. Throwing things or hitting people, but uh, you could say that would be an accurate statement. <laughs> Did you ever hit Priscilla? She lied to me about something. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't punch her. I slapped her on the face. That was the only time. So, I, I mean, I assume your position still is that you had nothing to do with the shooting at the house. That's correct. Uh -huh. Who do you think could have done it? No possible idea. I think that her story's been forgotten. Priscilla was the most vivacious magnet that people were drawn to because of both her glamour and her positive energy. She's been vilified, of course, and she's thought of as the beautiful blonde bombshell that was on the other side of the tracks. And as we know, that's how Colin got off for the murder of her child. Duke was tall, blonde, beautiful, and rich, a tabloid staple. The mid-20th century wasn't the viral celebrity sex tape world we live in now, but the press was still incredibly invasive. So when news broke that Doris, this famous socialite from one of America's richest families, might have intentionally killed her best friend, the public geared up for the trial of the century. Justice would be swift for Doris, they thought but they would be wrong. I first started looking into the Doris Duke car crash last year, a little over five decades since the incident occurred. I grew up in New Jersey, not far from one of Doris Duke's estates, so I was pretty familiar with her. Doris Duke is known for her philanthropy. She's given a lot of money away to charity. She has all these foundations in her name, but there's all this mystery around her. She was so much of a recluse and she really liked her privacy. So people are always drawn to her and to know more because she was so tucked away from society. In a way, she was a reluctant public figure who did not like to be in the limelight. But again, she was drawn into the limelight because at the time she was one of the richest women in the world. Newport was a summer playground for the wealthy. Duke loved the peace and privacy, and it wasn't surprising that she enjoyed Octobers there when the summer homes were left vacant as tourists returned to the city. She lived somewhat anonymously, tucked away in her property as she liked. She spent years there before the accident, which wouldn't happen until she turned 53. She was settled down as much as a person of her celebrity could be. Doris Duke and Eduardo Torella knew each other for a good decade. They were pretty close companions. They confided in each other. Eduardo Torella was a New Jersey native. He was famous in his own right. He was an interior designer as well as a movie set designer. Eduardo was also her artistic curator and he helped design her homes on her many estates. So she trusted him and really sought his advice when designing her homes. According to an article in Vanity Fair, Eduardo was planning to give his notice that he was going to cut personal and professional ties with Doris and head out west to California. He wanted to get his career in the film industry off the ground and felt that Duke was stifling it. If he was going to stay with her, he was never going to make it big. Eduardo told his partner, as well as friends and family, that he was going to cut ties with Doris Duke, and they warned him about this. They said it would anger her and that it wouldn't end well. 
but he wanted to tell her in person, and that's why he was with her the day the accident happened. That night, Doris wanted Eduardo to drive her to an appointment. They got in the car, ready to go. Eduardo was in the driver's seat, but he had to get out to go open the gate to get onto Bellevue Avenue. So he put the car in park and he got out and Doris slid over into the driver's seat. She claims that this car suddenly leapt forward. She doesn't know what happened. And at some point, Eduardo was pinned against the gate and the car crashed straight through the gate and into a tree on Bellevue Avenue. Doris was found in a fog wandering around. She was bleeding from head wounds and she didn't know what happened. And Eduardo was found under the back of the car crushed. He had died instantly. Police did not question Duke for two days after the accident occurred. Why did officials wait 48 hours to question the only witness of Eduardo Torella's last moments? Reporters were stationed around her gates, trying to get access to anyone who worked for her. But it was under investigation, and the police weren't talking. Not even a little over a week after this incident occurred, she was donating money left and right. She gave $25,000 to restore historic Cliff Walk in Newport. Then soon after, she gave 10 grand to Newport Hospital, which is where she had been staying after the incident. And a few months later, following these donations, she had set up the Newport Restoration Fund, which was meant to restore 84 colonial era buildings in Newport. A lot of people believe she bought her way out of this, that she paid blood money to make this go under the rug and just forget about it, to get her out of the limelight and that pretend this never happened. A lot of the evidence seems like it was mislabeled or it just mysteriously vanished, even court cases, her statements. So it seems like whether there was a cover up or the police didn't do their job, there was a lack of accountability at the time and that's what makes it so much harder to dive into this case and find out what truly happened. The official conclusion of the investigation was that Torella's death was not intentional. Rather, it was just an unfortunate accident. But the Torellas maintained that Doris Duke intentionally and deliberately ran over Eduardo. They filed a suit against her in 1967, seeking $1.25 million. For years, the case dragged on, and five years after the incident, Doris Duke was found guilty of negligence and ordered to pay the family $75,000. The fact that Eduardo was her, such her close friend, why wouldn't she want to help them out and be there for them at this time? She caused the death of her friend. The story of the car crash incident pretty much was a blood stain on Doris Duke's legacy. While she did a lot of great philanthropy and she donated a lot of money and she really did help people, this just couldn't go away. This was on her record forever. People couldn't stop talking about it. And while she was a recluse early on and into her later years especially, you know, people were still curious what really did happen. Well, the only person who actually knows what happened is Doris Duke, and she took that secret right to her grave. Robert H. Richards IV raped and sexually abused his four-year-old daughter for the last time. As he had before, he warned her to keep this a secret, but this time she didn't. She told her grandmother, who told her mother, who told their pediatrician, who told the police. Richards was arrested and charged with two counts of second-degree rape, punishable by a minimum prison term of 20 years. But Richards, an heir to the $16 billion DuPont family fortune, didn't get anywhere near the minimum of 20 years in jail. In fact, he got none at all. He pled guilty to a charge of rape in the fourth degree, paid a fine of $4,395, and promised to attend a high-end treatment center in Massachusetts, which he technically couldn't because he wasn't allowed to leave the state of Delaware. So that's where he stayed, receiving psychiatric care and group counseling for sex offenders. And this all stayed under the radar for six whole years. DuPont family history goes back to the French Revolution. The DuPonts were actually very close with Louis XVI, who was executed during the French Revolution. So after he was executed, the DuPont family decided to flee France and they came to the United States. 
The DuPont Company, which originally manufactured gunpowder, transitioned into a chemical giant and today has revenues of $21.5 billion. The family is huge. Around 4,000 members share the $16 billion family fortune. They've had notable members like Pete DuPont, the former governor of Delaware, but they've also had their share of criminals like John DuPont, who was found guilty of the murder of Olympic gold medalist David Schultz, and he later died in jail. And while it took a few years, the unemployed tier two sex offender, Robert Richards, living off the family trust fund, was now in the public eye. A rich man walks free after he admits he rapes his three-year-old little girl. Prison. Are you aware the DuPont family owns Delaware pretty much? Well, I mean, they're a yeah, very you know. wealthy family. Okay. The public outrage started in 2014 when the mother of Robert Richards' children filed a civil lawsuit asking for monetary damages for Robert's crime. This was the first time the general public heard about the 2008 case. We don't know why local media missed the news. It's not easy. The civil suit revealed that during his psychiatric treatment, Robert was actually not really revealing all of his thoughts. And in 2010, his sex offender counselor asked for a polygraph in which it was revealed that Robert may have also touched his younger son. But for whatever the reason, the further allegations uh, were investigated, but they never led to another charge. So the words that the judge said at the time was, you know, you have incredible family support and you should be grateful for that and you should get treated. So a lot of people said, is this the type of treatment that someone else would have gotten? So I dug into this. I reached out to the police department that was investigating this. I also reached out to Robert Richards himself and no one would comment on this. Eugene Moore did not want to talk to me. I also reached out to Judge Jan Jordan, who presided over the case at the time for comment. And she wouldn't comment any further on the case. And it is, you know, almost impossible when no one talks to you, it's almost impossible to find out if he actually did get special treatment. But even though we don't know that, what we know is that he had access to the best lawyer in Delaware and only the richest people can do that. So he had that in his favor, the fact that he could tap into any source that he could. Eugene J. Moore Jr is known as one of the most prolific defense attorneys in Delaware, famously defending Stephen B. Pennell, the Delaware serial killer, as well as former Delaware Deputy Attorney General Thomas Capano, who was found guilty of murdering his girlfriend. During Richard's sentencing, Moore called the six foot four, nearly 300 pound Richards a somewhat gentle person and argued he would not fare well in jail. Hours later, Richards walked away from Delaware Superior Court a free man. But now that this was all made public, people wanted answers. Judge Jan Jordan took much of the heat, getting so many threats, she ended up hiring private security detail. In addition, Beau Biden, acting attorney general at the time, also received much scrutiny. So much so, he published an op-ed in Delaware's The News Journal, defending the punishment. Meaning, if this case went to trial and Roberts was found not guilty, he would have walked away free without any restrictions. But by not bringing the case to trial, the court was able to nearly guarantee he would be registered as a sex offender, receive counseling, and be on probation and parole. One thing that I found out when I was talking to an expert who looks at crimes against children, that it is very hard to convict someone when the victim is a minor and is very, very young because children at very young ages are not really considered strong witnesses. So in the case of the rape of a minor, it is easier for someone to make a case that they are not guilty. In Robert's case, he had already pleaded guilty. But again, the current system kind of enabled him to get away with a smaller punishment in comparison to jail time.